Welcome back to a, another video session today. Today we're going to be focusing on some more of the security aspects of the competition between China and the United States. One of the primary areas or the biggest area focused of China and the United States is of course Taiwan amongst many others. So we're going to be focusing on Taiwan today which is this small little island just off the coast of China. It's approximately 130 kilometers at its closest distance to about 220 kilometers at its furthest distance across here. So it's not a small distance to cross by sea when you consider the English Channel, which had to be crossed in World War II, is a far smaller gap where the Allies crossed between the UK and the beaches on Normandy. So you can see it's a much, uh, well, it's a much larger trip when you think about it. When you look at the uh, uh, the, the scale of the differences, this is about uh, it's a 50 kilometers down here. So you can see the closest point. The channel is a lot narrower if you wanted to cross it. Although this is probably the widest part, but it's much closer in terms of air support, resupply, and things like that as well. But we have much more modern weapons these days, much more modern uh, technology and much larger economies and things like that to help support such an invasion. So back in 2017, I wrote my very first post on Quora actually, how would a war between the US and China play out? And it got uh, over, uh, nearly 100,000 views, 315 upvotes, 100 comments, it was quite popular. It was quite a lengthy one, it was a bit like a, a, a story that's how I wrote, which um, uh, as well, it was uh, it was interesting. Uh, it got uh, quite a few um, upvotes. It was basically along the lines of it was basically a, a fictional a fictional scenario where China invaded Taiwan. Um, it was let me go back to my map. It was basically a fictional scenario where China invaded Taiwan, um, uh, a rapid strike and where a situation where the United States didn't respond for three days. China didn't attack US bases, it was just trying to invade Taiwan, quickly seize it, uh, and it was about, to, I think it was two or three days, I can't remember the exact story, it was about 24 to 36 hours later, the US launched a massive response um, via uh, its strategic bombers and long range air power, launching massive strikes on the Taiwan Strait, shipping amphibious ships and the Chinese fleet all around this area. And it was all long range attacks from the continental United States. It kept its carriers and ships well out of range, except its um, nuclear attack submarines, which were all in this area, and they all launched strikes and stuff as well. And then you had your F 35s and F 22s, stealth fighters, and B 2 bombers, and all that type of stuff. We'll get into that in a bit of detail. So one of the first things, uh, the problem with Taiwan is the Chinese fleet has to secure the sea lanes that supply sea lanes across here. So it has to first secure, isolate Taiwan from air and naval support because any support coming to Taiwan through um, uh, resupply aircraft or ship is gonna come from the east. So it's gonna come either from the Philippines, from Japan, the United States and other islands in the Pacific into the east of Taiwan. Because in Taiwan you can see it's predominantly a large mountain range through the center and the eastern side which makes it very difficult to seize this area. And it sort of protects the eastern side of Taiwan and this is where some key air bases all are on the side of mountains and things like that. And a lot, there's a lot of uh, um, uh, fortresses and caves and that all built into these mountains where Taiwan keeps a lot of its equipment, aircraft, missile batteries and stuff like that so it can survive the first range, uh, first volley of um, Chinese uh, attacks, particularly from its ballistic missiles and aircraft. So China's problem is to isolate the whole island 360 degrees, otherwise you can get reinforcements coming in and resupplies, a little bit like the Ukraine gets now, but it's more difficult because they obviously have to cross a lot of ocean. It's, um, it's not just across the border from Poland or Romania, so it's, it's uh, more difficult to resupply Taiwan. So one of the first things China's going to do is it's going to use its long range missiles, which we can see here, which are there, there we go. So it's got uh, numerous uh, 
intermediate range, short range, and uh, medium range ballistic missiles that can be launched from its land bases, which are predominantly in Western China, out in its uh, more remote desert areas, or, uh, central China. And um, it can all be launched by aircraft as well, cruise missiles, and it has some uh, bombers, uh, H6J bombers, which can fire any ship cruise missiles, and it can actually fire ballistic missiles now. Some of, some of these um, larger missiles can actually be fired via an aircraft. They can carry one of them under the belly of them, and I'll try, I'll make, try and get a picture later. But you can see the range of these missiles from their short-range missiles, which are well within the range of Taiwan, which is the short-range ballistic missiles here, and then you've got your longer-range missiles, such as your, your DF-17, which is a uh, hypersonic missile you know, with a Goliath warhead, so it's uh, harder to intercept. It's uh, not impossible. We've seen uh, Russian hypersonic missiles be intercepted in Ukraine by Patriot batteries, so the US is well on its way to developing defences against hypersonics, and they believe they can successfully defend from it. Uh, we, we won't know until actual combat, but so far we've seen actual combat in Ukraine, and hypersonic missiles can be intercepted. Um, although the Kinzel missile the Russians use, it, they say it's hypersonic. It can reach hypersonic speeds, but I don't think it's a true hypersonic uh, uh, missile in the modern sense. It's more just like a uh, air-launched, small ballistic missile, really. So anti-ship missiles can reach, uh, they've got a range out here, nearly 3,000 kilometres. DF-26 is the furthest ballistic missile at 4,000 kilometres, which reaches beyond Indonesia, pretty just almost to... Uh, Australia's doorstep nearly than the um, uh, ballistic missiles or any ship cruise missiles launched from a H6 bomber can reach actually the Australian coast and Australian ports all the way past Papua New Guinea way out to the Pacific Ocean yeah. uh, Guam is uh, I think Guam's about I think Guam's about here or around here so it's well within the range of this so this is the problem you've got and also don't just think of this side Think of this side as well, because these missiles can easily fire into the Persian Gulf, the Strait of Hamas along here. They can target ships out in the Indian Ocean. They can target ships through the Red Sea, through the Suez Canal, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, or they can hit, also there's not just uh, ships, these can hit US bases. This would put, um, I think Diego Garcia might be in range. I think it's out around here somewhere. It's an island in the Indian Ocean, a US-British air base out there. And all you think of all the American air bases in the Persian Gulf, uh, through Iraq, uh, NATO bases in Turkey and Eastern Europe, uh, Greece, the Eastern Mediterranean, if there's any carrier battle groups there, but it can be quite vulnerable. It's coming for the Suez Canal or the Red Sea. So just keep that in mind. Um, and particularly with the oil transport, you could easily think of uh, 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 China wanting to protect its oil coming through this way so this puts all of this within range of Chinese uh, ballistic missiles and also air attack they won't fly to India but you can imagine perhaps uh, Pakistan mm, that they are somewhat friendly of the US so but they are more friendly of China um, you can imagine they, uh, China might get some overflight rights through the Central Asian republics they could go to the Caspian Sea and then they could launch cruise missiles and stuff into the Mediterranean and all around this area. So just keep that in mind of any future conflict. It won't be limited to the Pacific. China has reached to hit all of this area. So keep that in mind, that's very important. Okay, so we'll go back to the world map. So so for China to uh, secure this these oceans, it needs to have naval forces, submarine forces, and air forces. And you can see recently of all of their uh, air operations across the uh, Taiwan Strait. A lot of them are predominantly focused on this area because they know a lot of the support will come from the Philippines and Philippines, you can see it's the closest, largest landmass to Taiwan. So they know that a lot of the uh, support will come from this way. Some will come from um, Okinawa and uh, Japan, maybe South Korea if the United States is involved. That is a further distance, so and there is a lot of Chinese bases and that around here which can help to try and intercept it. Be a lot of air battles uh, through this region, so it will be it will be no easy feat for the Chinese to get air superiority, but they do have a lot of air bases here. They do have 
the proximity of geography. They are much closer, meaning it's a bit like um, the Battle of Britain where the Germans had to fly over uh, ocean and then uh, enemy territory to fight the, the Battle of Britain to try and gain air superiority. So this time, um, the Chinese, uh, while well, they had to fly across ocean um, and enemy territory somewhat with Taiwan, that they, they, they can probably gain air superiority within a matter of days over Taiwan's air force without help from the United States. And then they'll gain air superiority around the surrounding oceans. So China is in a good position in terms of air power, being able to get air superiority if the United States doesn't intervene. If the United States intervenes, then the, the US will try and set up combat air patrols over, they won't try and contest this area with air control straight away. It's, they'll just take too many losses. They'll be trying to control at first the eastern approaches to try and keep supply and um, uh, reinforcements coming in through here because they'll be trying to set up a uh, air supply corridor or reinforcement corridor where their bombers, uh, not their bombers, their, their strategic transports, airlifters can come in and, and bring in supplies, troops and weapons. So they'll be flying cap missions from uh, bases in Okinawa and Japanese islands here. They've recently got more bases in the Philippines. Uh, so they will be trying to get uh, uh, flight over flight rights and stuff from the Philippines and using that to fly missions into eastern um, Taiwan or the western Philippine Sea rather. So this will be a heavily contested area. The Chinese know that they've been practicing missions all around here. Now, we hear a lot about these um, carrier killers, ballistic missiles that the Chinese have, and they do have them. Uh, how effective they are, we don't know, against a carrier which can move at plus 30 knots. Um, and by the time you fire a ballistic missile from deep in China, up this way, a ballistic missile into the Pacific Ocean, that's a long way. That's a long distance. There's probably less than four or 5,000 kilometers, probably more. So that takes a lot of time. A ship can move a long way in that time. So you need to have constant surveillance either by satellite, which I would assume the Americans would be aware of and be jamming or destroying them, or you need constant uh, surveillance from ship, ship radar, which is hard because of the horizon, or aircraft. So the Americans will be having a lot of aircraft up to try and intercept, and prevent that as well. So uh, probably maybe stealth drones, types of stealthy drones that the Chinese are developing, you would have them out in this area as well. And they would be constantly doing uh, 360 patrols around Thailand, they're already practicing it. And it's a form of blockade as well. So, But the Americans are not gonna sail their carrier battle groups into the Pacific um, Ocean within close range of uh, Taiwan or the Chinese mainland to just get uh, fired upon by Chinese ballistic missiles. Carriers are for ocean control. They're gonna sit their carriers more out in the deep oceans. They're gonna have their carriers out in the deeper oceans, further away from China where any ballistic missile attack will have a significant warning time and they'll have larger strike groups as well. They won't just be carrier battle groups that we see today. They'll be task groups, task forces where you have multiple carriers, two, three aircraft carriers and amphibious ready groups in the one fleet. It won't just be a couple destroyers, two, three destroyers or cruisers and then a, a single nuclear attack submarine. It'll be you know, 10, 12, 15 destroyers and cruisers all protecting one carrier battle group. You'll have allied forces. You'll have Japanese, South Korean, Australian, maybe British and other European nations eventually when they get to the theater. But initially you'll have larger American task groups. They'll have multiple carrier battle groups forming up as one task force and they'll move together. Just like in World War II, the Americans didn't come steaming in from uh, Hawaii and attack straight into Japan with its carriers, even though they only had two or three. Um, that escaped Pearl Harbor. They didn't go directly and attack Japan straight into the strength of the enemy or wherever their main fleet was. No, they went down into the Solomon Oceans and engaged the Japanese here, uh, far away from their main support. The Americans will do similar. They're not going to go charging straight into the Taiwan Strait and sail their carriers right through there for the Chinese to sink them. They'll keep far out of range, build up their forces, 
and as they gain control of the air and sea around here, which will be a lot of the, uh, Los Angeles and Virginia class nuclear attack submarines will patrol around these areas. They'll be going down to the Malacca Strait and trying to block transport down here, Chinese shipping. Uh, there'll be carrier battle groups or task force out here intercepting uh, uh, Chinese uh, commercial um, shipping and oil tankers and gas tankers, all that type of stuff, and basically uh, blockading China from a distance. You control this choke point, a few choke points here. The Americans already control the deep Pacific. There's not a lot the Chinese can do about shipping out here. The Americans control that area of all their air bases and islands across the Pacific, and they've got Hawaii and that there as well. And this area is full of Australian and um, uh, we got French, French Polynesia, you got Vanuatu and all these islands, New Zealand and that, so uh, China can't do anything about this. So all they can really do is try and contest the oceans nearer China, which is going to be a lot more difficult. And once they've used their ballistic missiles, they can't replace them rapidly, not their larger ones. They can replace them, they're building them uh, currently, but they don't, can't replace, like if they fire off, you know, like a, a hundred in a salvo tr targeting some ships, you know, they're not building a hundred a day. 100 a week so it's going to take some time to replace those type of losses so don't think that the carrier group is going to come in there steaming in there and uh, get sunk the only way that would happen is if china did a surprise attack on taiwan and they had targeted the americans at the same time um, and hit japanese air bases american bases here american bases in the philippines south korea um, they'd strike at um, guam uh, palu and uh, any other bases they could reach. And if there happens to be a carrier strike group here, like with the US 7th Fleet, one carrier is based in uh, Japan, currently the, I think it's Ronald Reagan, um, if they, they'd probably try and sink that if it, uh, in theatre if they were able to. So, but then you're talking about, you know, one carrier has five to 6,000 US personnel on it. If they did a surprise attack on a US carrier and sunk it, and then and to sink the carrier, you have to sink most of the battle group as well. So you've got, probably three or four destroyers and cruisers around there. That's another thousand Americans. And then you've got a nuclear attack submarine, which that might be right. There's probably a supply ship or two with it as well. So you're talking 7,000 plus, 8,000 plus Americans you've just killed. So if you don't think you just started World War Three, you've got rocks in your head. The Americans are not gonna go, oh, you know, we'll just let this one slide because it happens to be China. They're going to hit China with everything it's got short of nuclear weapons. So if the Chinese think the Americans aren't prepared to fight, they've got rocks in their head. Every time the Americans are attacked, they fight like tooth and nail to um, avenge their losses, basically. Just as the Japanese had the last time it went. For some reason, countries keep always thinking, oh, the Americans are weak, they've got no staying power. Well, they stayed in Afghanistan for 20 years. It might have fallen in a heap, but that was still 20 years. They've been in Iraq ever since uh, 2003. They haven't left there yet, although most of their forces are out. They've still got some forces there, and Iraq's still a democracy. Um, so I don't know why people think they've got no staying power. You know, even in Vietnam lasted 10 years, and that was uh, a disaster, but they're still there for 10 years. So if you want a war between China and America for 10 years or more, God, the planet will be wrecked. Uh, forget about global warming. Okay, so... We talked about the Chinese ballistic missiles and what they can do, um, whether they can do it. We talked about American carrier battle groups and what they can do. So they're the, the primary weapons for either side. So it's going to be a bit of a standoff. The Chinese are going to bombard uh, Taiwan with ballistic missiles, air attacks, bombers, cruise missiles. They're going to hit everything and try and do a rapid strike. They'll probably try and do a uh, take out the Taiwanese government and seize key uh, positions and kill the leadership and, and try and... Uh, take out Taiwan in uh, 48 hours or so, uh, if not faster, and seize key areas. Um, of course, the Taiwanese know this and they've prepared a lot of defences for this. So it uh, depends whether they can do it or not. You know, the, the Russians couldn't do it in uh, Kiev, and that was much shorter distances and uh, large forces. We've had them across oceans and things like that, and they were nowhere near as prepared as the Taiwanese are prepared and been preparing for you know, decades. So I don't think that'll happen. I don't think they'll be able to take out uh, Taiwan in 24 hours. I think it's going to be a, a multi-week, multi-month campaign um, to take Taiwan. So you've had the initial onslaught. The Taiwanese have survived. They've probably lost you know, 50, 60% of their forces, air forces and things like that. But now what, uh, as the Chinese invasion forces approaches, what happens? The, the Taiwanese 
as they've learned from um, Ukraine, you only need small teams of people, soldiers with uh, short range uh, anti-ship missiles, um, or even short range, even uh, the, the, the harpoons, which are very mobile on backs of trucks and things like that can be launched uh, 80 kilometers across there. The harpoons can easily reach all of the Taiwan Strait. Um, even even if they're approaching landing beaches, um, I'm going to zoom in here. Like a lot of Taiwan is not suitable for um, landing. Um, there's only certain areas. I think uh, around the south is not too bad, but Taiwan has strong tides as well. So there's only a few months of the year. Uh, I think it's uh, around July or August and October, a good time. So around about now actually. Uh, but a lot of. Uh, Taiwan is not good for a ocean invasion because a lot of it's um, cliffs, mountains, and uh, I think some of the best beaches are around it down the south, actually, on the eastern side. I think there's some good beaches down here, yeah, and good tides and things like that. So, but so you only need small teams of uh, any ship missiles, even anti tank missiles as invasion forces are, uh, are coming ashore. Let's zoom in on a beach. Um, let's find a beach. It's hard to find a beach. Hard to find a beach. I don't zoom in here somewhere. There must be a beach here somewhere. Yeah, so there's a nice fields and stuff here. The type, oh, is that water? Is that fields? Could be rice. So you can see here, it's not really much of a beach or anything, is it? It's like all oh, channels and so it's going to be hard, hard to get ashore. And it can be quite uh, very, very, very shallow as well. Uh, depending on the tides, but you can imagine. See, look, see, look, there's a seawall there, so it's not a beach. It's all seawalls and reclaimed land. It's really hard. See, here, it's a lot of ports. So, where are you going to just land? Maybe here. Here we go. Here we go. A bit of beach, bit of sand. Yeah, here we go. So imagine you're coming ashore, uh, and Chinese amphibious forces, and you've got the um, Taiwanese forces all back here. They can launch any ship missiles. They're going to have lots of cheap drones coming into the beaches, hitting the tanks, hitting the troops. Is all going to be mined and uh, anti-tank uh, um, obstacles and all this type of stuff? There'll be bunkers and foxholes around the place. So these forces are going to face uh, huge amounts of uh, incoming fire. You're going to have all the pre-positioned uh, artillery, which is going to have all these sectors marked. And I'll be calling it artillery fire and MRS fire, like HIMARS and things like that, similar to that. And they'll be laying anti-personnel cluster munitions. will be firing down on the invasion forces, the ships and all the um, amphibious vehicles coming in. Landing craft will be getting hit by any ship missiles, artillery. Um, you might have aircraft as well if the Taiwanese are prepared to commit any aircraft but I don't think they would initially to stop the invasion I think you'd leave it to ground forces you might have um, uh, Taiwanese submarines out there fast uh, attack boats torpedo boats things like that coming into the Taiwan Strait doing hit and run operations um, and, and to talk, talk about drones just a, a couple of days ago we saw drones hit uh, a Russian airbase in Ukraine in Kursk, where uh, the the anti ship missiles were just um, like this, they were just cardboard boxes, basically made of cardboard. They're made from my country, Australia. One of our companies makes it. They're all just made of uh, cardboard, and they've actually got. You can see here, it's a wax cardboard. There's some rubber bands to hold it all together. A little motor, little batteries and stuff in there. It holds, I think, four to five kilos of explosives. Um, and they're undetectable by radar. They're quiet enough and undetectable. So until you hear them or you can see them or you, something explodes near you, that's it. You can't detect it. They cost a few hundred dollars to make. These things took out, destroyed four Russian fighter jets and damaged another. There was uh, one MiG-29 and four uh, Sukhoi 30s or 35s were destroyed and damaged at a Kursk Air Base just a couple of days ago. It was only, I think it was only um, formally announced today. Then we had a couple of other larger drones uh, hit uh, Peskov uh, near uh, Latvia, Lithuania, up that way in Russia. And they had a couple of Aleutian 76 strategic transport planes destroyed and two more damaged. Um, that was a lot longer range hit, but that was longer, longer range drones. And they flew like 800 kilometers. So you can imagine 
hundreds of thousands of these things that's and like this and like all the quadcopters and everything you've seen in ukraine imagine that multiplied by many fold the time we need to be mass producing those things and buying them up now and stocking them up and getting all the munitions ready so imagine just these things just pummeling an invasion force constantly so you can uh Imagine what would happen, and then you have your longer range drones just flying across, hitting the air bases, and the Chinese can't detect it on their radars. You'd say just the cheaper drones fly them over there, bang, 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 hitting Chinese air bases, and all the cheaper drones flying and pummeling the uh, landing forces. And if anything gets ashore, you keep hitting them. And then it's not only um, the invasion force, it's their supply forces. They've got to keep that group supplied. So then you, they've got to so they keep hitting the supplies also with um, uh, drones um, and any ship missiles. And don't forget about mines, smart mines. There's a lot of mines uh, all along the Taiwan Strait that are only activated in a time of war. They're smart mines, so they're not active until uh, someone flicks a switch. So there's a lot of mines out there. Plus, uh, you've got to think of submarines. So US nuclear submarines will also be a major factor. The US has a, a big technological advantage over China, at least a generation in front. So um, the Taiwan Strait is not that deep, so it's not the best place for nuclear-powered submarines. But you can bet the Americans, if they're trying to stop an invasion, they'll commit a few to um, interrupting that as best they can, or they'll sit them away a bit, say down here, and they'll fire missiles at the invasion fleet depending if they uh, go invade in the south and predominantly it's in the you know, normally in the south the beaches um, for invasion and the forces that have to uh, i think it's around here in the south they have to work their way up the coast um, towards taipei um, if they uh, they'd probably hit taipei with power power forces and commandos right so let's talk about um the american response what would the american response look like other than let's say um uh, China has hit uh, Japanese air bases and US air, air bases and they've taken casualties um, in Japan. They've probably hit South Korea. They've probably fired ballistic missiles and launched air attacks on Guam and and um, perhaps mitigated uh, some of the effectiveness there, although Guam is in the process of doing a massive uh, build-up of air defences, anti-ballistic missile defences all around 360 degrees because one of the weaknesses of Guam currently is it's not 360 degree protection. So the Chinese could fly in cruise missiles and attack from like the east or the south and when Guam's predominantly focused on attacks from this direction. So that is uh, a weakness, but they're doing a massive build-up here between now and 2029 um, with the GS Ashore systems. Um, that's the same system that guards the U.S. carrier battle groups. Um, it would be with uh, THAAD, um, the recent uh, THAAD, which is theater area uh, defense, air defense for and that's against air and ballistic missiles as well. It's got very powerful radar. Have Patriot Pack three batteries like we've seen in Ukraine. There's also Iron Dome, uh, the Israeli system, which protects um, Israel against all the Hezbollah uh, rockets. They've got that on here to take care of um, short range targets. Um, drones and things like that so there's there's a massive build up going on to defend Guam because that's going to be the primary US base in the in the sort of mid Pacific there to help reinforce um, and launch missions to help defend Taiwan you can see how far away it is it's still a long way much better than launch from the Philippines or from Japan or some of these islands here but this is going to be frontline stuff so the US response would come in the form of um, initially uh, it's going to be uh, strategic bombers and they'll fly from bases in the continental United States from bases uh, across the US uh, maybe they'll refuel in Hawaii or uh, probably not Guam, Guam will be under attack but uh, they could even, the US is even preparing bases in northern Australia um, Tyndall Air Force Base south of Darwin so it's down here somewhere uh, where's Tyndall? There it is, Tyndall there. Tyndall Air Force Base, we can probably even see it on here. There it is. US is building massive um, uh, tank farms, ammunition depots and things like that all here. Well, there's some other bases to prepare for strategic bombers so they can fly missions up through the South China Sea and fire missiles and into the Taiwan Strait and Chinese bases and things like that. So one of the main weapons the U.S. is going to use is the LASRAM, or the LARASM, LARASM, it's the AGM, 
158C. It's the long range anti ship missile, that's why it's called LASRAM. And it's very stealthy, as you can see from the pictures here. Very stealthy design. It's got a range of about a thousand kilometers. I think, I think it's around that. Uh, range, where is it? Range. Yeah, 500 miles, nautical miles, 926 kilometers. So it's a sub subsonic, meaning it's uh, not supersonic, but it's very smart, very stealthy anti-ship missile. Now, the United States is uh, producing these in ever-increasing numbers. Uh, they don't have thousands of them, they have hundreds of them, and they're going to have hundreds more over the next, and they're wrapping up production over the next five years. Now, these will predominantly be carried by B-1B bombers, which we can see here, the B-1B bomber, strategic bomber. Now, this bomber is actually can carry the most ordnance of any uh, in the United States Air Force. Now, it can carry up to 24 of the LASRAM bombers, or 24 joint air-to-surface missiles, which is the AGM-158A. So the LASRAM is the C version of this, so it's the same um, basic type of missile, but the other one is, this one is a land attack missile, so which the US has thousands of. I think it's about over 2,000, 2 to 3,000 of these, I believe they have. Last time I looked it up, so the B-24 can carry 24 of these, but then you've also got the B-52, which can carry 20 of these on, mostly on external hard points. Now the B-52 has also a subsonic bomber, um, long range, heavy, heavy payload. Uh, so it will also carry a lot of those. Then you've got the B-2 stealth bomber, which uh, can be used in an anti-shipping role if needed. Although I don't think they would use the B-2 maybe for this role. They could if they really needed to. It'd probably be used to strike other higher priority targets on the Chinese mainland, such as command and control air bases, radars, maybe things like that. Uh, it would be used for more risky missions, I would think. But if needed, this can also carry 16 LASRAM or um, JASM, uh, which is long-range standoff missiles. Uh, they're all cruise missiles, stealthy cruise missiles, to strike targets in China. So uh, they have uh, 20 B2s. They have about um, another 100 B-52s and B-1s uh, combined. So bit, I think it's, well, it's about 100, just under 150 strategic bombers. So because they've retired a bunch of the B-1s, because um, they're getting quite old, so they're trying to keep the funding for the force they've got and modernizing it and keeping it operating. B-52s are currently being modernized, getting new engines, so they're gonna be around for a long time. Um, and then you've got the B-21 which is currently under development, the new US stealth bomber, which is slated to enter service uh, in 2025 or after then. So I think it's gonna have its first flight later this year. So yeah, two, three years, it could be entering production and then entering service. So that sort of fits into that time frame of around 2027 or when a lot of people think that China will launch an invasion of Taiwan or it'll be ready to launch an invasion of Taiwan. Now the Americans want to produce about 100 of these, uh, but there are now plans uh, by the US Air Force to have 200 and there are, well, wish lists to have over 300. So I think it's about 330 something. Uh, but that, uh, would depend on the threat level that China presented and Russia. I don't think they really need that many, but I think a figure around 200 would be realistic to replace all of the existing force and then have a larger force because this 150 strategic bombers were slated for a, a, a post-Cold War era. We're sort of in a new Cold War era. So the, you'd think the strategic bomber force would have to grow again. And this is uh, smaller than the B-2, but it's meant to have longer range because it's going to have better engines, more aerodynamic, uh, better stealth. It's meant to carry a large payload and have very long range. So exactly what that is, that's all classified. We don't know much of the details on it at this stage, but that is uh, another thing to keep an eye on over the next couple of years. So all these uh, bombers will be flying from the continental US over the Pacific, getting refueled, and they would be 
coming down and hitting and launching their missiles from about a thousand kilometers away which is probably going to be we've got the distance uh let's have a look at the so that's 500 kilometers there so if you do double that so that's about yeah so talking about around about this distance here from the chinese mainland or the taiwan strait they'd be firing missiles off so that's a fair range and you have to remember in between here along here and all in here this is probably going to be where u.s fighters are operating you're going to have f-15s f-35s operating from uh japan and bases here yeah you're going to have uh fighters with tankers maybe operating from guam but probably more so from the philippines you're going to have lots of fighters coming up from bases in the philippines so you're going to have convergence you could even have bases from uh, fighters from south korea but that depends what the situation is with the south korean government we've not allow that or not so you have a convergence of fighters over this area. Maybe there's a carriers out there as well, perhaps, but I don't think they would have the carriers in this area. It'd be too close. They'd be further out of here, I think, until things settle down or they gain control of the situation. So they would come in and they would be launching long-range, uh, long-range anti-ship missiles into the Taiwan Strait or hitting uh, bases, uh, ports all along the coast, hitting the Chinese Navy. There'd, be, there'd have to be Chinese Navy ships out here trying to. Uh, form a blockade of Taiwan, or maybe there's submarines, but the, uh, uh, the anti-ship missiles probably target the forces in the Taiwan Strait. The, uh, maybe the maybe China will use its carriers here, who knows, but its carriers would probably be used out here to try and gain air superiority, but for me, they'd be sitting ducks out here, really. They're just, uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't use the Chinese carriers out here. I'd be keeping them well away for the time being. So even in war games, um, a majority of the Chinese fleet gets sunk, even in scenarios where China uh, does very well and nearly wins, um, but the US and its allies are able to stop China, but with large losses. I mean, there's, there's quite a few reports you can read about online about that. But the, pro the problem China has is they can't stop these strategic bombers because even their long-range interceptor, the J-20 um, stealth fighter, and I'll just um, I'll just bring that up uh, the J20. Let's bring that up. Uh, so you can see J20. Yep, there we go. Uh, Chengdu J20. So the J20 is a big aircraft. It's bigger than the F22, um, but it's predominantly stealthy from the front. Not so stealthy from the sides or the rear, really. So it's got a frontal aspect stealth. Uh, nowhere near as good as the F-22, but it's still stealthy, somewhat stealthy, still pretty good. So it's predominantly designed to attack the enemy from the front, um, launch long-range missiles, um, um, volleys of long-range missiles, and then get out of there. That's what we think Think its role is, like an interdiction, because the, if you think about what would be happening, you'd be having uh, long-range bombers coming in here, maybe you have all these fighters coming from Japan and Guam and the Philippines. They're going to need tanker support to stay in the fight. The J-20s would fly out, try and shoot down those priority targets like the tanker aircraft to eliminate them from um, the air battle going on in this area and also any um, uh, airborne command and control planes that the Americans have, the E-3s or the, um, the new Wedgetail ones they're going to buy. So... That's what the J-20s would uh, primarily be doing. Because if you take out the tankers, you take out all the all the air support, pretty much. Um, still, their, their range, they could get out here, and with their long-range missiles, they could maybe hit the bombers at their furthest range. Maybe. But then, out here, the US is going to make sure it has more cap and more air patrols than that anyway, which is probably going to be outside the range of China to be able to hit, unless they want to suicide their carriers out there. There's one thing that I would do to stop American strategic bombers, and it's not anywhere in the Pacific. I would, if I was China, hit them while they're in the United States. If you're going to launch an operation against Taiwan, and this comes down to China, China's philosophy, hit the enemy where they're not, where they're not strongest, where they're not expecting it. A bit like a Pearl Harbor attack. But what would happen? Um, now imagine all the hundreds of thousands of drones that are imported into the US every year from China. 
in other Southeast Asian countries. And you've already seen that there's been Chinese um, police stations across the US, there's been Chinese agents all around the place harassing other Chinese citizens who talk about China. Um, you know, Chinese influence on universities. There's probably hundreds, thousands of agents across the United States, um, all around the place, because uh, the United States is the primary enemy. Get rid of the United States and China dominates the world. So I would, if I were in China's position, I would get hundreds or thousands of drones similar to this or you know, quadcopters, maybe a bit more advanced because China makes heaps, heaps of things like that. But even things like this, um, uh, very simple, and I would attack U.S. strategic bases, U.S. Uh, bases where they've got um, their their bombers at, and hit hit them. You know, have just have people near the air bases launch these uh, drones, just a couple of kilos of explosives in each one. The B ones and uh, B fifty twos are parked out in the open. Hit them. The B twos they're in protected shelters, so they'll be a bit harder, but you can still hit the shelters, hit the front doors, hit their fuel tanks. Uh, the, the, the fuel tanks at the air base and uh, create just fly over drop little bomblets on the runways like this this um, this one here this has got a cluster munition in it it flies over the target and goes poof, and drops a cluster a whole spray of uh, little explosives uh, in, in a pattern on the ground so it's not just that it hits the target and explodes it's a cluster munition in here it's very effective um, <laughs> yeah really good against particularly against aircraft and that's why they use it to attack those Russian Sukhois and MiG-29s that's what I would do so before the bombers can even leave their bases hit them here you could fly these drones into power plants into um, fuel pipelines uh, communication centers across the US and it could be thousands of these little drones you know everyone's got one you know so it's not hard to hide the fact so that's that's something I would plan. That's you know, that'd be my Pearl Harbor and hit 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 them all there. And then you could also hit the F thirty five bases and plane and tankers. Hit their tanker bases. You know, take them out. They're all lined up all around the place. That'd be easy targets. So you know, just like what's happening in Ukraine, just on a much larger scale with you, with China's ability to produce and and there's thousands of containers coming into the United States every um, every week from China. So you could easily sneak them in there uh, most of the containers aren't searched they have no idea what's coming into the country you could probably you could probably land you know a couple of divisions of chinese troops just from container shifts <laughs> maybe they'd probably be um probably be spotted but uh, drones definitely you can import them into america and yeah that, that's what i'd be thinking of doing anyway uh, that's just an idea i would do and you could imagine they could do that in japan south korea philippines you know, australia hit key bases even you know maybe maybe the uk but you talk about starting a world war over taiwan which is pretty much what it's going to become anyway so that's that's an idea i had uh what the chinese could do to um intercept those bombers which are going to come into here and uh give give China a bad day or a bad week. So you think each one of those planes flung over can carry between 16 to 24 missiles. So you can imagine how much damage they're going to do. And it's going to be very hard to detect them. They fly very low to the ocean. They're hard to uh, detect because they're so stealthy. Um, so the Chinese fleets and ships are not going to have much warning because uh, the horizon's only 15, 15 miles. So the Chinese destroyers, uh, uh, their radars aren't going to pick them up until they're quite close unless they've got AWACS over this area and we've looked down radar, which uh, may help to detect them. But um, that will be a very hard thing to do. So this is just an overview of some of uh, what's gonna happen uh, with a war in Taiwan. Um, and this is, this is gonna be a series of videos because I'm gonna cover, uh, go into all of these aspects in a lot more detail. And, and then also the economic side of things, the supply side of things, the global consequences. Like, imagine what happens if there, there is a war here and it's part of a larger strategy from China and you've got North Korea invading South Korea at the same time and then you've got um, Iran maybe invading Iraq or Saudi Arabia or attacking all the shipping, uh, non-Chinese shipping in the Persian Gulf. Maybe Iran shuts all shipping to everyone except um, its friends and allies, you know, one of them being China, you know, um, so it wouldn't be too hard to imagine problems like that and then some of you know you could get problems in Africa you know some of the countries which aren't as supportive of um, 
uh, the West and much more friendly to China. So you've already seen problems in lately in Niger because uh, Russia's unsettling things there. So you can imagine all these other countries, you know, uh, throughout Africa that uh, China has influence on could cause some trouble. There's a whole whole range of problems which will um, occur, and you can just imagine the economic fallout from this. You've got China, South Korea, Japan, Taiwan. Um, you know, we haven't talked about the semiconductor problem and Taiwan controls the, the semiconductors or manu doesn't control it, manufactures 80% uh, of the world's high-end semiconductors. So you've got one, two, three, four of the world's key economies which supply the world with a lot of their stuff all in this region and all likely to be heavily involved or heavily impacted by this war and the fact that um, uh, two-thirds of global trade uh, occurs in this region and through these oceans. This very ocean with a war would be fought. So you imagine what's going to happen to the global economy. It's just going to be destroyed. It's going to be a depression like we've never seen before. Um, yeah, so uh, that's uh, going to be the video for today. Um, so it's a lot more involved uh, with this and a lot more detail to go through, but we'll get through that over the the coming weeks and months and we'll share a lot more uh, information on what's going to happen if we have a war in uh, Taiwan but I hope uh, uh, I've shown a, a few things that perhaps you didn't know about a few give you a few ideas to consider um, and we're going to go into a few more things um, a few more ideas I've got that China may do um, to uh, you know, get the US offside, the allies off, offside. So, you know, everyone knows about cyber, cyber attacks and um, things like that. But, uh, you know, there's a whole range of things China can do. You know, you're talking uh, with modern countries with power plants and water supply and uh, our transport systems, communication systems. You know, like what happens if there's, you know, we've seen movies and TVs, but what happens if one EMP you know, detonates in the middle of America and sends you know all of this into the 17th century again you know and like with one nuclear device you know detonates there or you know or you shut down all the nuclear power plants or some nuclear power plants are um, you know hit with drones or sabotage somehow with um, cyber attacks and things like that there's been lots of drones flying around over the last few years Nuclear nuclear power plants, um, nuclear power plants in the United States, you know, mapping them out and testing them, and lots of drones flying around you know, U.S. Uh, weapons uh, testing zones, military training zones, and we've all heard about UAPs and things, and a lot of them are foreign nationals, uh, Chinese uh, drones. Uh, not all of them, some of them are, um, because why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you spy on where, where the U.S. is training? Of course you would. You know, you'd send drones up probably from nearby. Um, container ships or you might have some submarines out here you might just you know launch some drones stealthily uh maybe some special forces somewhere out here and they're launching drones to monitor u.s war games and u.s exercises going into of course you're going to do that you know and then well, how do you get intel on u.s war games you know in nevada and things like that we're well, going to fly have your agents in there launching drones locally and gathering information and intel that's just common sense i would i'm sure the americans have got their agents in china doing the same you know just we don't hear about it Anyway, that's it for today, guys. Leave some comments, give me some um, likes, and subscribe to my channel if you want to keep um, learning about all this type of stuff. Uh, thanks for tuning in. I'll see you guys next time. Bye for now.